So welcome to another exciting uh, episode. Okay, we are Kitzah Shuchnarach, the abridged version of the Code of Jewish Law, chapter 84, then number four. Number four, chapter 84, uh, paragraph four. All right. Also, the Ishala says beggared out Sifa. Now, a lady can't wear a garment over her hair covering. Again, we're speaking about where there's no Arif. So, those of you who live in an Arif, you're safe. Uh, in a place where there's no Arif, so we can't carry in the Rishusha Rabbim in the public domain. So, this is talking about in the public domain. Obviously, inside, you can wear what you like. Carry what you like in the private domain in the in the Rishus Hayochid. but in the public domain, um, we can't wear this rain covering uh, things that we have over the lady's hair covering. The and likewise, ish shomim. If a man puts on one of these uh, rain hats that they have. Um, Because you're not wearing it. In other words, you're not wearing it for you. You're wearing it for the clothing. Rabbi, can I interrupt you, please? When you said the woman is not allowed to cover the uh, the wig that she covers her hair with when it's raining. So let's say she has a, a wig or a, a chief or something she's having. So if she wears something on top only to protect the clothing, then she can't wear that. In other words, you can wear layers of clothing. We'll, we'll mention soon. You can wear layers of clothing when that's for you. But so, nothing um, to protect the hair that's not hers. Right, yeah, but not to, okay. not to, not to cover another covering. I, okay, now I understand. I'm yeah. sorry. I... Yeah, no, that's fine. Because then that's not considered wearing. You're not, you wear things for your own comfort or covering or shelter. So, um, you know, in winter, you might wear, probably not in Florida or places, but in certain places, you wear several layers in winter. But they're all for you. They're not to... Not to protect them, right. Okay. Yeah. However, the in kavanosam shloyed sara oisam agsham in mutam. If the intention is that you shouldn't get annoyed by the rain. So let's say, for an example now... Um, this plastic little hat, especially the ones I have today with like a elastic things that goes over your hat or your wig or hair covering. If it's to keep the rain off you, then that's fine because you might have a, a hair covering, whether it's a hat or the lady's hair covering. And then once it rains a little bit, it soaks through and annoys you. So if you're wearing this other covering on top to your intention is so you're not bothered by the rain, so the rain doesn't bother you, then you're allowed. Because that's considered now wearing something. The issue was only if you're wearing it to protect clothing or a covering, not because of you. So you could have two people doing the exact same thing. And for one of them, it's a problem. One of them, there's no problem purely on their intention. And we can see there's many mitzvahs, um, well, potentially many circumstances where the intention makes all the difference. So uh, not black and white, but, you know, that's okay. Rabbi, <laughs> so, uh, yes. Uh, what do you do with a man's raincoat with a new, that new hood that they have with the, over the, 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 the hat? It's, it's very large. Yeah, so so if it's made, so if you're putting it on to, um, well, that's part of the coat that you're wearing anyway, so there's not so much of an issue. But if it was a separate piece, then um, if you're wearing it to protect the rain, keep the rain off you, then there's no problem. If someone only wore it because of the hat, um, that could be problematic. But if you're asking about the size of it, 
Um, he's got to pull the drawstrings. You know, I, I've worn one of them without a hat as well at times. When you put over your hat, it's not too bad. Um, but generally, um, I think when you wear those coats, you know, it's to keep the rain off, your, off you, um, not just to protect the clothing. All right. Any other questions? Or do we satisfactorily answer everyone's questions? Everything is fine. Okay. Number five. Again, so someone who is lame, right? They got a they got a, a walking problem. Likewise, someone who's recovering from an illness. Similarly, perhaps a, an older person, Muslim, quite an older person. They can't walk at all without a walking stick or a crutch or something like that. They are allowed to go out into the Rishus Rabbim, into the public domain, with their walking stick. However, if they're able to go without a walking stick, and inside their home, they don't use the walking stick, but when they go out the street, it's just to give a little extra support. You know, they don't, it's not an absolute necessity, it's just a help. Then also, then they're not allowed to um, take the Shusurabim. So again, uh, it's not, you no, know, it's not intention in this case, but it is uh, the situation changes. You know, the facts on the ground make it different for the person. Likewise, a, a blind person. They can't use their stick for walking outside without an Eiruf. Now, if you have a, another person, they don't need a walking stick at all. But, you know, not so much nowadays, but there was a time where carrying a walking stick was very trendy. Especially had a silver handle or something, you know, it was very, uh, you know, meant that you were an important person. So they don't need the walking stick. It's just for uh, decoration. Yeah, decoration. Make themselves look uh, very uh, well dressed. Self-important. That's right. You know, I mean, there was a time, you know, people walked out the walking sticks and, you know, that was, uh, if that's the situation, they don't need it at all. Also, the says boy, I feel a mockum shesh erevin. They can't even use it when there is an erev. The shum is the loss of a Shabbos because it like cheapens Shabbos a little bit. It's like a weekday activity if they don't need it at all. Right? They're just carrying it for, uh, you know, whatever reason. For, well, it's for vanity, for vain purposes, right? It's not yeah, needed. Es essentially, you know, it used to be a fashion accessory. Right. Um, you know, I don't think there's many circles today where it is, but as we see with fashions, they just keep coming back. Rabbi, you know, what uh, about as a as a weapon? Um, Protect yourself. No, that's that's a very good question. So uh, weapons is really going to depend on circumstances. Okay. So I'll 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 I'll, I'll give an example, uh, a left field example, but just to help us get the um, the idea. So in ancient times, uh, when we still had the Sanhedrin, this uh, supreme Jewish court, we didn't use a set calendar. We used to witnesses would see the new moon, and they would come to the new court. They would come to the court and testify. And uh, ideally, that's how we should have it. And God willing, when Mashiach comes, hopefully today, uh, we will go back to that system. Towards the end of that system, and what led to its demise, was that there were various groups who were trying to undermine it, trying to destroy it. So there was the Minim, who were essentially the early Christians, and, uh, and there were other groups who uh, wanted to ruin the Jewish calendar. 
uh, for their own purposes. So you could a person couldn't be trusted to testify anymore because you didn't know if they really saw it. They may have been someone who had an agenda to testify a day early or something to, to change the calendar. So you could only have someone that the court knew. Now, since in the land of Israel, there were many, many people, you know, I don't know, numbers, let's say a few million. Obviously, the members of the court did not know everyone from every town. So if it was someone who the court did not know, they would send along important people from the city that the court did know. You know, maybe the, the court member of the city or whoever, someone that the court would recognize. And that person would testify that this person who saw it is a kosher person. You can rely on him. And then he could give his testimony. So they were even allowed to go on Shabbos. They could carry food. They could carry food if the trip was long. They could even, and this is to answer your questions, we're told they were allowed to take weapons if they had a reason to, cons they had a concern that they would be attacked by these people or whoever. Maybe they got to, you know, the highways weren't the safest place, places in those times. So they were allowed to take weapons to protect themselves. So use as an example, if you're in a situation where there is legitimate concern, I mean, I know anything could theoretically happen anywhere, but most places in the Western world, uh, you know, most of the time are, are reasonably safe. But if a person is in an area or a place or a time where there's legitimate concern, then they can carry um, weapons. Um, Okay, where, where I live, there's an Arif, so it's a little bit different, makes it easier. Um, once there's an Arif, the issue with the weapon is muksa, because normally you don't use it. It's not, it's not the Torah prohibition of carrying in a, in a public domain. Um, but I have several attendees uh, in my shul um, who, uh, you know, wear guns. You know, they come on Shabbos. Um, you're, you're talking about because, because of they're trying to protect themselves and whoever is in, in and around the temple because of yes. some yeah. horrible yeah. things, right? Yeah. Okay. So the way the situation is here at the moment, if there was not an Arif, I don't think you'd be justified to, to carry the weapon um, in the public domain, the way things are in this, where I live at the current time. But when there is an Arif, and it's just a Muxa question, then, um, you know, I don't, I, under the current circumstances, I think uh, it's okay. So, you know, they've all asked my permission, and that's the, uh, that's the, um, how we look at it now. So when you ask about weapons, I mean, not trying not to answer the question or to just give a convoluted answer, but I think it really depends on the circumstances. So generally, wearing a weapon would not be considered wearing, it would be considered carrying. But unfortunately, you know, we, we're all familiar with Jewish history. And there's a time and a place, um, you know, and, uh, you know, each person has to look at their, their circumstances. That's um, with weapons. All right. Uh, yes. You have to unmute. When I was in Baltimore, it was on the edge of a very bad uh, crime-ridden area that unfortunately spread over to where I was to live. And I used to take with me a pepper spray. So I don't know whether it's, it, they had an area. So I don't know whether that would represent a weapon or, or something, well, but it's just to cover myself, you know, when I walk back in the dark. Yeah, yeah. so in Arif, where it's just, the only issue is muksa. If you have any concern, um, there shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Um, if 
and look, depending on the area, even potentially if it wasn't an, an Arif, maybe it could it might be appropriate. You know, but you'd have to look at the uh, the situation. But um, yeah, that's uh, you know, even if it hung on a chain or something, you know, that would be carrying as opposed to wearing. Um, so mm -hmm. if there's need and when there's an Arif, there's not the carrying issue. If it's to save a life, it's still made Correct, correct. But that's why I was saying, you know, it depends on the circumstances. You know, if, um, you know, I, I'll give it, give it again, a slightly different example. So let's say um, many areas they have at Salah, right? they have the uh, Jewish ambulances. So um, there are people who are carrying radios, you know, uh, two way. Um, and, and things on Shabbos, and they've got them on. Now, there's not necessarily a person at that moment who's in a life-threatening situation. Right? So when there's someone who at that moment is in a life-threatening situation, then we're allowed to do whatever we need to do to help them. But there'll be many times throughout Shabbos where there's no one at that particular moment in a life-threatening situation but they still carry their phones or, or radios or various things because there's a reasonable expectation that something could happen. So that, that's similar. So this is why I was saying it, it's, it's um, you know, actually I had, when I was still in Australia, I had um, a fellow who used to sit at my table in the shul. He was the one who answered the phone. Right? It was actually... I mean, it wasn't funny because if someone called, it was obviously uh, a dangerous situation. And, uh, you know, we don't laugh at people's uh, expense, God forbid. But it was a bit of a funny sight. You had this fellow who, who looked as, uh, as religious as you can. All of a sudden, his uh, cell phone rings. And he's on the phone. I, I mean, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an emergency. It's not, it's not a social call. And then out of the other pocket comes the uh, the the radio, and he's you know he, he was a dispatch on Shabbos. Oh my! So wow. um, you know he went ran out to the foyer, so it's not to disturb the davening, but but he's answering the first second. So even before he gets to the foyer, because sometimes emergencies every second uh, counts. So he's got these things with him, and it's on. And for the majority of Shabbos, maybe there's there's no calls. But because there's legitimate concern and there's the situation is um, that it may be needed, so therefore he's allowed to um, have them. And I, and so similar with the weapons. I mean, this is life saving. I, mean, I guess weapons can also be life saving, even even when they're taking a life, they can still be life saving. But it's uh, you know, I think you have to look at the circumstances. Is there a uh, legitimate concern? Okay, number six. Misha Osa Bashauslo, someone who's in chains. They're shackled. They're allowed to go out, wear them on Shabbos, because this, unfortunately, the people who are in chains, this is the normal uh, wearing. Now, some people who are in chains obviously don't have any choice. You know, they get marched on, uh, you know. They don't get to choose where they go out in the public domain on Shabbos. But there may be someone who's chained, uh, God forbid, and they may have a choice to go out or, or perhaps stay home if they have to for Shabbos, but they're allowed to go out chained. Um, there is a synagogue in, uh, in Australia, in Tasmania. Um, Tasmania was one of the last places to still have convicts. And the back row has shackles on the pews, on the seats there, because they used to bring in the Jewish convicts and they would shackle them and the guards went outside. I always thought that was a good way to keep a minion. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's what happened. You know, today people sometimes have uh, not chains, but electronic um, tracking devices. And this can be for law things like the 
law situations like the chains, or it can even be for in the quarantine and various things. So we, we have situations today where people uh, are being tracked. Um, so can a person go out wearing them on Shabbos? Um, so it really depends. So most of them are worn, like they actually sort of uh, attach it around the leg or something. The ones that are worn, uh, then it's not a problem to, to have them on Shabbos, to walk out on Shabbos. So we're hopefully uh, no one here will have first-hand experience of those things. Number seven. Um, and Yotzim B'Kshorim, you can't go out on um, stilts. These are these long, long pieces of wood. There's like a platform for you to put your feet on them. And to walk through um, mud and water. So uh, we're not talking about necessarily the clown performers. They for sure can't go out in stilts. But even someone who wants to wear the stilts, um, you know, there's mud. They don't want to get their shoes dirty. So they come up with a clever idea of they'll wear stilts through the mud. You can't wear them. You can't, you can't take them out in a... Uh, if you have an Erev, there's no problem. But when there's no Erev to go out to the uh, Rosh Hashanah, into the public domain, we can't use our stilts. So I'm sorry if that affects anyone here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Pets, number eight. Now, we mentioned this uh, last, not last week, but last, last time. We can wear uh, some type of plaster or, or bandage on a wound. Now, there's a condition on this in the brackets. This is long as you did not put it on the wound on Shabbos. Now, that's not to say you can't put a bandage on a wound necessarily. You know, depends what type of wound. Right? You know, we, we, we've we said many times before, any life-threatening situation um, needs to be dealt with and potential to lose a, a limb, God forbid, which could even mean use of the limb, not actual amputation or something like that. That's also considered, that was life-threatening situation is also for limbs, not necessarily to the whole person's life. So there'll be, I mean, God forbid anyone should know, should be in a situation where it's required, but there could be many situations where someone can uh, apply dressing uh, or even stitches of various things on shovels. But we'll keep it more simple. You know, this uh, a basic cut, um, you know, it's uh, not too terrible, but normally you would put something on it. Um, so if you want to go out on Shabbos, then you can't put that, put it, put it on. Because since it's 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 for curing, it's for medicinal purposes, it's considered like an ornament. All right, so, um, and therefore a person can wear it. And you can also wrap an inexpensive piece of cloth that becomes insignificant to the dressing. I'll explain why in a moment. And you can wear that. So, if you recall, we, we mentioned at the beginning of this uh, chapter last time, that anything that a person might take off, so in a public domain where there's no Erev, anything that a person takes on and off or is likely to show people, so you can't wear that. So we gave an example for an example, um, sunglasses. Sunglasses, you know, they come off in the pocket, on the face. So when there's no Erev, uh. so we can't wear them because that, that person just without thinking, can take them off and put them in his pocket and, and keep walking. So another example we gave are 
things that you take off to show people. So um, you know, this will change from time to time, place to place. There might be a certain time where um, people take off bracelets regularly and show people and everyone wears people's bracelets and tries it on. There might be certain times and places where person never takes off their bracelet outside. You know, it, it could change. But if it was a situation where people are going to take it off and show people, so then we're worried they're going to walk the four amas, this approximately six feet in the public domain, carrying it in their hands and not wearing it. So then they wouldn't be allowed to wear it. Only in a place where, and I just made up a bracelet, but, but anything. So in this case, a fancy cloth that was wrapped around, um, at, at least you know, in Talmudic times, people would often take that off and show people. They say, oh, that's a nice um, whatever. And so it wasn't something that stayed on. But it was more of a cheap cloth. So and it and it becomes uh, secondary to the dressing. So it just becomes an accessory to the dressing. You know, sometimes. And we see, so for an example, the bandages. We, we, we often see people today, nowadays, they have, uh, you know, a gauze and whatever it is, uh, dressing, dressing. And around that, they wrap a bandage. So it's not a fancy thing that you're going to take off and show people. It's become an accessory to the uh, dressing. And therefore, you're allowed to wear, wear that in a public domain as well. Does someone have a question? No? Okay. I will double chashuv, but if it's something very fancy, you're going, for example, it's a, uh, like a fancy scarf, you know, that, that people would take on and off and show. You can't wrap that around the dressing. If you say, a bottle of Gambi Haratia, because it does not become secondary to the dressing because it's so fancy. And also, it's not the normal way to wear it. The Harvey Master, and therefore, it's carrying. Okay. Questions, thoughts, comments? No? Okay. Number nine. You can go with a piece of cotton or something in your ear. If it's to absorb discharge from your ear. So if someone has a, uh, an ear infection or something and they have um, a bit of cotton or something they put in the ear to absorb, you can wear that outside with no aerial. Now this is only though it's put in tightly, so it won't fall out, right? Because again, the concern is if it falls out, someone's going to carry it on Shabbos in the public domain. But if it's uh, not going anywhere, it's, it's, it's in well, there's no problem. Likewise, with like a, some type of padding or a straw in your shoes. I don't think many people put straws in their shoes to straw in their shoes than a, uh, to make them a bit tighter, you know. But yeah, you know, we there are those things that you buy and you can put them in shoes, uh, or in your hat, you know, to, to make it fit better. Rabbi, uh, what about uh, people keep carrying the the sprays, uh, antiseptic sprays, and they spray it all over everything, especially if I when I get in and out of STS vehicles. They're always spraying, you know, where I sat. When in reality, I, I've had all the vaccinations. I'm not, and I don't, you know, uh, these spray things that the uh, on Shabbos. I mean, I, uh, they're not really allowed to be doing that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so if there's not, well, there's two things. There's the spraying, and there's the carrying. So if you're in a city where there's an Arif then to carry them outside is no problem. In a place where there's not an Arif, then probably, you know, you wouldn't be able to carry those sprays. You know, if you needed one in shul as well as a home, then you should have another one, you know, organized to have another one there. But the actual spraying... Um, That's what I'm... Constant, so, I mean... 
But actual spraying, I mean, you know, I think some people are a little bit trigger happy with the with the spray. <laughs> But, but the again, again there, there is a time and place. So normally, we we if everything was uh, settled, um, you know. So if we look back, let's say for example, two years ago, we, we didn't spray things. People didn't spray things the way they do today. That's for sure. So if someone has again, this is the kind of thing. If it, if, if it's legitimate concern, there's legitimate cause. Um. You know, I'm not sure how, how much a lot of these things actually even help and different things. But, you know, that's not my area of expertise. But if there was a situation that, you know, there's legitimate reason, you know, actual reason to do something and it's going to be uh, beneficial, then then so be it, you know. And again, an example, there's, there's many things that people do permissibly you know, in a principle way for patients in hospitals that we don't do at home. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, the, the, the facts on the ground are, are different. You know, we're, we're, we're in different circumstances. Um, you know, so I'll, 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 I'll leave it to everyone. You know, look, personally, I think, like I said, I think people are a bit trigger happy with the... Uh, with the, with the hand sanitizers and the, and the sprays and the various things. But um, everyone has to look at their circumstances. Some people have have uh, perhaps underlying conditions, makes them more susceptible, so they have a greater concern. You know, it's all, everyone has to look at their, their uh, situation. All right. Um, number 10. Um, now, number 10, wait till we finish because, <laughs> because it's, people are going to get worried midway through. Okay, so number 10. So wait till we finish the panic and then you'll see there's nothing to panic about. Right? Say, say, Isha Bamay, she's kinol in the dosen. A woman cannot go out with a menstrual pad. Shaloy and Natafi Begadehal is designed to protect her clothes from getting uh, soiled. Likewise, she can't go out with this with a type of apron, which is for the same purpose. Um, I don't think anyone uses those aprons today. I haven't seen one, so I can't tell you what it looks like. However, Elaim Kain Hu Malbush Gomer. The apron she can only wear if it's a proper clothing. Okay. Avo, however, this is why I said don't 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 get excited yet. In the sense of Moich, it's a sinner b'shvil the hatzil. It's atzvim in itself. If she's wearing the menstrual pad, all this, all these other things, for her, no, it's so she doesn't feel all yuck. You know, if she gets all, you know, there's too much of it, she's going to feel uncomfortable. Then she's allowed to. So similar to what we had about the rain clothing, if someone's wearing the plastic rain hat, so all the rain doesn't come and bother them, then there's no problem. If he's wearing it only to protect the hat, then it's problematic. So if, if this pad is only to stop uh, clothing getting soiled, then we can't wear things uh, to protect clothing, then it's not that's not considered wearing. But if it's to stop the person from feeling uncomfortable and you know helps them feel cleaner, you know, it's now it's for the person's benefit, then they're allowed. Because otherwise, you know, the blood is it, it's gonna dry in the skin, it's gonna it's 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 uh it's uncomfortable. So if they're doing that and you hate sound, they're gonna you know, we say we're going to be suffering. I mean, I'm sure people have been through worse, but suffering, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable experience. Then the tourist that says to him, then she's allowed to go out with them because she's wearing it for her. In other words, so it is a clothing. It's it's for the, her benefit as opposed to being something that's for clothes. So it's, it's a layer of clothing for her, not a layer of clothing 
for a layer of clothing. Okay. Any uh, questions, comments? No? Okay. Number 11. Um, by the way, this is the same thing with the, with the rain hat. You know, uh, some places you wear, um, uh, what are they called? You know, the rubbers on your shoes. You know, uh, they're like slip on this uh, rubber, especially when, when it snows. Um, everyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So if wearing them on Shabbos with no Arif just to protect shoes is, is problematic. If the person knows what happens is if your shoes get all soaked, then you got wet feet. And, and particularly when it's cold, that's uncomfortable. So if you're wearing them to uh, make yourself comfortable, you don't want the water to seep through your shoes and make your feet wet, well, then you're allowed to wear them. Right? So... It, so it, it, just like the rain hat, you can have two people doing the exact same thing. And one of them, it's halakhically permissible. And the other one is uh, halakhically problematic because it just depends on the intention. Is the intention to be a clothing for a clothing or a clothing for the person? Yes. So it's uh, not enough. Uh, so it's not uh, enough. Uh, so I, people have to be muted or something. It's not enough that a person says, I just want to do things according to halacha. I'm not sure what the halacha is. I just want to do what's kosher for halacha. And uh, hopefully it'll work out. That's not enough. A person actually has to know the halacha and the difference between this proper thought and this improper thought. I'm yeah. asking. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, sometimes, yes. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's, um, it's more black and white, you know, uh, person can't eat pork even if they have good intentions. But, well, having said that, life-threatening situation, you know, I'm not sure what life-threatening situation that it could be. You know, someone's stuck on a desert island and the only food is pork, otherwise they starve to death, you know, maybe. But generally speaking, it doesn't matter the intentions. But certain things, uh, it matters. So again, using these rubber slip-on things for your shoes, we know that we are allowed to wear multiple layers for our benefit, but we can't wear something that's just protection for clothes. So if the intention is just to protect the shoe from getting snow stained or whatever, um, well, we can't do that because he's not wearing it for himself, he's wearing it for the shoe. If the intention is so the snow or rain or whatever it is doesn't soak through, you know, he doesn't want to end up with wet toes, he doesn't want to feel uncomfortable, well, then he's wearing it for himself. And then it's a clothing for him. So his intention makes it what it is. And uh, without getting too much off the topic, but since you asked about intention, you know, we have situations where not necessarily halakhli, you know, make it permissible, not permissible, but you can have intent, you can have two people do the exact same thing, and the intention can make it uh, one person's beautifying the mitzvah, and the other person is. Uh, being disrespectful to the mitzvah. So I'll give an example. A lot of people like the Hanukkah menorah with oil. So some people, you know, they got cups and they fill it up with oil and they make wicks and they put in the wick and they do that. And some people buy pre-made um, cups with a wick all set to go. So you can have two people use the pre-made. One person is beautifying the mitzvah Another person's being disrespectful to the mitzvah. I'll explain in a minute. And you can have two people prepare the oil and the wicks themselves. One of them is beautifying the mitzvah and one is disrespecting the mitzvah. So how do you have two people do the same thing? Because it depends on their intention. So I'll give an example. One person, he pours all the oil and he makes the wicks himself. Why does he do that? Because he loves the mitzvah so much, he wants to do every part of it. He wants to pour the oil. He wants to make the wicks. He, he cherishes the mitzvah, wants every part of it. So for him, doing that, 
gives honor to the mitzvah. Then you have someone else who would much rather prefer to buy the, um, the uh, pre-made ones, but doesn't because it costs more money. So he makes the wicks and, and, uh, and pours the oil because it's cheaper. Now, again, there are some people who have limited budget that don't have a choice. But I'm talking about when, when they have the choice. So one person took this, he, did, he made it himself because he loves the mitzvah and wants to do every part of it. And the other person made it himself because he doesn't want to spend the extra money. He wants to do the cheapest way possible. And unfortunately, that's not respect to the mitzvah. Then you have the other way around. You have one person who buys the pre-made cups, even though it's three times the price of making it, of doing it all yourself, because it keeps it much cleaner. And he's willing to spend extra money to make the menorah stay beautiful and clean and, and to make it nicer. So he's honored the mitzvah. Then you have another person who got the pre-made cups just because he couldn't be bothered making wicks or putting wicks in the cup. You know, he doesn't want to spend his time. So two people made the wicks and, and pulled the oil. One beautified the mitzvah, one disrespected the mitzvah. Two people bought the pre-made cups. One honored the mitzvah and one of them disrespected the mitzvah. They did the exact same thing. All it was was their intentions. So um, intentions can make a, a, a huge difference. You know... Uh, Rabbi, I have a question, please. Yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm on a limited budget and I, I cannot afford to buy everything kosher. I, I just can't afford it. So, and most of the time I will make bread myself and, but I buy kosher flour and kosher yeast because out of necessity, because I, I can only have no gluten, no wheat. I can't go to the bakery and buy a challah made with wheat because I, I have serious health issues. Yeah. My intention is not to be disrespectful because I'm, it's just a, a question of mo money. It's a question of money. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, look, I, I understand. And I think, you know, the examples that I gave was when and I emphasized the person had the means to get it, to spend more. They weren't just spending less because they didn't have. They spent less because they're being lazy, which is a difference. So let's just clarify that point. Okay. The second thing, you know, w without getting into any individual specific um, situation, although... You know, if someone wants advice, I'm happy to speak to them outside of the class. But, you know, today, Baruch Hashem, generally th things can be afforded one way or another. Now, sometimes you need, you need advice or guidance on, on how and where to find the best things. You know, but th there's a lot of things. And I can assure you, you know, uh, uh, having 11 children, some of whom are adult and married and supporting themselves in various things now, but uh, I can assure there's been plenty of times that we were quite tight on, on budget, you know? So, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, we were always, always able to uh, have kosher. Didn't mean that we could always eat steak, you know? But, you know, the, and there were times where we had to make choices between certain things, you know, um, couldn't have both and, and, you know, different things. But, you know, many things uh, are available um, quite affordable, but you have to know where to look. Right. Now, sometimes, sometimes don't. So also, so I'll get to you in a second. And it, even not available to stay here in Phoenix, there are certain things that you can't buy here. And then people come to my house, and I'll give an example um, certain types of chips that are made, potato chips that are made specifically kosher. The, you know, the bishop said, anyway, it's a higher level of kosher. So people are surprised when they see it in their house. Where do you get it from? So tell them, Amazon. Amazon? <laughs> Amazon. That's right. <coughs> so, yes, they don't sell it here in the kosher section in Safeway or at the kosher supermarket. But we, uh, you know, we Baruch Hashem live in a world where 
things are excessive. Usually there's a back door when you can't get the right the things the way you want the price you want in the front door. So okay. and not always, not always, you know, and uh, but there are many things and uh, and and I definitely understand uh, living on a budget and not in class time, you know, if if you ever wanted to speak to my wife about the because she really sort of finds these things, how to find different products or or products that are weren't necessarily made intentionally kosher, but they are kosher and therefore it's more affordable. Um, you know, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, put in touch Thank with my you. wife and, and can probably find something. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank you. So, I, Isaac, you had a question? That was beautiful. Thank you. No? Okay. Isaac, you're, uh, he's, uh, he's muted. Isaac, you're muted. Did you have a question before? Yeah. Am I okay now? Yeah, you're okay. Do you hear me now? Uh, it's it's a little muffled, but yeah, let's try. Oh, if it's terrible, I'll stop. But all I was going to say is it goes back to my constant theme of the only thing we have free choice over is our rough time, what we want to do. And what I hear you saying basically is, and this is why you need Hashem to be the judge, because nobody else can judge why you're buying this wick and why you're buying that wick or why you're doing this or that. I think the essential lesson that you're saying is basically your rotsain. What is the reason you're doing something? If you're trying to get up on the cheap, you're not fooling God. God knows every second what you're doing and why you're doing it. So you just got to learn to be honest with yourself and do things sincerely. So right. if, you can, if you can slap menorah in the window because everybody else does and make it the cheapest way you can, you no, no problem. You'll just get a matching reward. And if you want to get the proper reward or the potential of the mitzvah, it depends how much you put your will into it, what you want to do and why. That is that correct. To all mitzvahs, yeah. it applies to price. That's all. Yeah, but I'll just just to clarify that a drop more, just clarify a drop more, um, without spending too much time on it, and that is what we really need to do is the best that we can. Now, for some people, sometimes uh, the cheapest or easiest way happens to be the best that they can at the current moment. You know, when the so it's it's not. I, I'm not I'm not uh, speaking against you know taking the cheapest route. You know, there's definitely a, a time and a place. But uh, the the main thing is that it should just be our our best effort, our best intention, and our best uh, concern. And uh, when we combine that with the, the knowledge like we're learning now and in your other classes, you put that best intent together with some, uh, you know, good Torah knowledge, then God willing, we end up with, with good results more often than not. Again, at the end of the day, no one's perfect. Only Hashem is perfect. And even with the best of intentions and the, uh, um, whatever, we, we can still make mistakes. That's, that's, uh, I doubt any of us could honestly say we never made a mistake. Uh, I, I may have made one or two in my life. Maybe more than that. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. Um, number 11. Number 11. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you're in a place where there's like mud and clay, you're walking, it's a dirty place. Not to like be a katsaspa god You can lift your clothes a little so they won't get dirty. They don't get soiled, don't get dirty. But to lift them completely, and this means like they're going to fold over themselves. You can't do that because now essentially you're carrying the clothes, not wearing them. 
Right? So an example, well, not really because of the getting dirty, but an example of sort of carrying while not work, wearing, um, you know, sometimes people, you know, gentlemen wear their, their suit jackets, they put it on without putting the arms in the sleeves. So where there's an air of, there's no problem. Inside, there's no problem. Outside in a, uh, you know, it was just a rabbin public domain where there's no air of, so that's considered carrying and not wearing. So you can't have clothes on you, but when it's not the method of wearing, then it's considered carrying. So you can pick your clothes up a little bit, but if you fold them over your arms, so, you know, you might have something technical a little bit on your shoulder, but the majority you're essentially carrying. Uh, so then that is not considered wearing, and we can't do that outside. Number 12, yes. Um, yeah. I, I have a question. I, it could be a politically explosive question. Okay, suppose an individual does exactly that. He puts it, he puts it over his shoulders, doesn't wear it per se, might be because the weather is too hot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, I suppose there is an Arab, but he doesn't support the Arab. In other words, he doesn't contribute to keeping to the upkeep of the Arab. So what happens in, in that kind of a situation? Uh, so here it's really going to depend on personalities a lot. So if there is an Arab, um, so technically he's, he's, you know, there's not a problem carrying it like that because there's an Arab. But in general, when you have someone who benefits from the Arab and doesn't use it, it's, uh, it's, it's, look, it's a problem. All those who use an Arab need to contribute. That, that's, that's, that's the reality. Now, there's different levels in that. On a basic level, let's talk about a, a small Arab. Let's just say that all of us lived in the same apartment complex. And we're, we're, we're the entire sum of the residents. Now, uh, we want to make an Arab so we can carry in the hallways and the, uh, you know, the children's playground at the back and whatever, the rec rooms. And I was all the, the common uh, owned um, Areas, various things. So we make an air of chatseris. Everyone has to contribute to be able to use the air. If anyone does not contribute, they can't use it. Could be they also mess it up for everyone. Now, if they don't use it, but they give up their share, so someone might say, "Look, I'm not interested in it, but I'm for Shabbos. I'm giving you my share in the in the." jointly owned property, then the rest of us can carry. But if he um, keeps his share in the jointly owned property and does not contribute, then the Arab is not good because we haven't all joined. There's, there's owners who haven't joined. So what ends up in a city to avoid that situation is two things. Number one is they, they rent from the city, usually a token amount, all the public areas, the streets, the parks, the, the sidewalks, you know, wh whatever it is. So there's no individual since, even though every resident in the city pays their taxes in theory is a, is a joint owner, but the city is the guardian, you know, the mayor, who, who, mayor, whoever it is in the town council is the guardian of these properties. So they sign the lease, and that's part of the Arab we have, city Arab we have today. So everyone's share is in the Arab. Um, as well as that, what is done, I'll say pretty much everywhere, I, I would imagine everywhere, is that when they set up the food, you know, because that, the Arab depends on having a common kitchen. There's a food somewhere that everyone can take. And since we now have this common kitchen, this fenced in area, it's like one giant house. So when they put the food there, they, in addition to saying that all those who contribute, contributed have a share, they normally give a share in this food to everyone in the city. So on a technical level, even people don't contribute someone's contributed on their behalf. I mean, they, they are a, a joint, a joint. Now someone's given them some of the food, 
the public areas have been rented. So on a technical level, um, they can use it. On a moral level, and, and some people don't know this. Some people just think, you know, the aid of the shill pays for it and whatever it is, and that they don't realize. But on a moral level, once someone's aware of how it works, everyone should contribute. Now, normally they have a, you know, let's say, say where I live, uh, I think it's $100 a year. They ask everyone to contribute. Now, I'm not saying everybody. Most people can contribute $100 in a year, especially if you can pay it off over the year. Yeah, there may be some people who legitimately can't, and they, and they accept whatever they can give. So that's on that level. So everyone should, should try and contribute something. Now, someone who wants all the benefits and never contributes, um, and, and not necessarily because they can't, just the, they don't. You know, we have this not with eight, not only with eight of them, we have this with shuls, with with schools. And again, there are many people who, who are not in a situation to contribute much or anything significant or or regularly, but people do what they do. You know, you know, there's there's uh, I know in my shul there are certain people who uh, give little bits at certain times. You know, and um, sometimes that is far more appreciated than certain people who uh, throw away, throw around uh, large sums, uh, but not because they're generous, but because they want everyone to know they threw around large sums. You know, so I'm not saying we don't appreciate that also, but sometimes we appreciate the smaller contributions because, as we know, it's all about doing your best. Judaism is about the journey just as much, if not more, than about the destination. Um, so it's a tricky issue in general. It's not other area. You know, it's people need to be influenced to contribute when they can. Sometimes, you know, we're pointing out to the person on the make situation worse. You know, it becomes now a fight, then becomes an ego thing. You know, I'm going to show them. Um, and Sometimes the wrong person points it out, then then you know it can the situation become nasty. And when I say the wrong person, it doesn't necessarily mean they're actually the wrong person, but the wrong person, you know, this person, the, the individual is going to take it from them. Um, but definitely something should be said by the right person tactfully. Um, you know, using the aid of. Please give something, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we said politically explosive. I mean, I don't, I don't think the answer is politically explosive, but, but how you deal with has to be very, sometimes has to be very politically tactful. Um, because, well, it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to make the guy who does, who's not contributing to feel bad or everyone get angry with him, then it's very easy. To deal with, <laughs> but, but if the goal is that the person should actually contribute, preferably willingly, um, then uh, you know it can be very difficult. You have to have the right, the right person to speak to them. You know, most shuls have that person with the golden tongue. You know, the one who can sell iced Eskimos. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure, you, you all know someone and. And, and to, to go over and try and speak to the person nicely at the right time. But you should. You should try and encourage everyone to contribute. It's important. But not only important morally that everyone contributes, it's actually important for them. Right. Um, right. You know, that, that they should actually be part of something properly. Rebbe? Yes. People, people are going to do what they're going to do. The boy Island knows why. And there's a story I heard years ago. There was one guy who always tried to get off the easiest and cheapest way. They say, how do you do this? He goes, yeah, shine rim. And he used to point, you know, yeah, shine rim. I can do this enough. Do this enough. Finally, his time comes. They take him upstairs to Gan Eden. They say, okay, you did everything. Everything we see here, you did, you know, you didn't miss anything. And they take him down the path and he sees nice houses and palaces and you know beautiful structures and they, they keep walking Malach pulls over to the side by the wide turn in the middle of the little outhouse the portable outhouse and the Malach says okay this is your place the Gan Eden and 
the guy says, this is Gan Eden? And the model says, yay, Shimrim. <laughs> That's right. You're very good. <laughs> so I, I, I just sent everyone in the chat my, my email address. So some people have questions, you know, for themselves and different things. So um, you know, and if, if, if anyone has any uh, uh, <coughs> questions, where you know, where where I I wrote Rabbi Wernick at which at gmail.com. Oh, at gmail. Thank you. Right. Um, so you know, if anyone has questions or things. You know, we're happy to, if we can, to help out or, or, or try and get them in touch with the right person that, that can help them. Thank you, Rabbi. So uh, we run out of time for today. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll say uh, Mazel Tov to Rabbi Smith on his uh, new addition to the family. Mazel Tov to you and, and your yeah, I'll uh, say Mazel Tov to myself as well, yeah, having right. a new grandson. Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. Actually, Mazel Tov. named Yitzchak after Rabbi Smith and my wife's grandfather. 